morning everyone to the community action advisory board meeting it's wednesday july 6th we are having a hybrid meeting this morning to adhere to the new open public meetings act what i'd like to do is just to start with introductions and uh, rebecca will be taking the role and as we uh say yes we're here maybe we could just do a brief introduction of ourselves so with that uh go ahead rebecca Thank you very much. In the conference room, we have uh, Amy Burke. Yeah. Just yes, Good morning, Amy. Do you want to do a quick introduction mm -hmm. of yourself? Please you speak just a little bit louder. Vice chair. Representative of uh, 1st district. I just asked, I was going to ask, is it the 1st or the change? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I the first district. Yeah, representative of 1st district. Yeah. And, okay. Should also have Bridget McClellan. Good morning. Um, excuse me. I'm Bridget McClellan and uh, I'm community representative in district. Two. Good morning. Good morning. Jamie Spinelli. Good morning. I'm Jamie Spinelli. Um, I'm a low income representative from District 1. Karen Kamaroff. Karen Kamaroff, low income uh, representative for, I always forget, I think it's District 2. Megan Molson. Megan Molson, low income representative for District 4. This is Megan Molson. I'm the low income representative for District 4. And Alicia Topper. Good morning. I'm Alicia Topper, Clark County Treasurer, and I'm an elected representative on the board. And then we have a few guests today. We have Jacqueline Wilcox. Good morning. Kirsten Ware. Good morning. Kirsten Ware, Interim Executive Director for Council for the Homeless. Willie Traub. Good morning. My name is Willie Traub. I work with the um, business unit in the uh, Department of Community Services for Clark County. And we have staff Janet Snook. Good morning. Here. <laughs> Janet with Clark County. And I'm Rebecca Royce, program coordinator and staff to the board. Thank you so much for that roll call, Rebecca. We do have an item of business for the board. We need to approve our May minutes. I would entertain a motion for approval. This is Karen Kamaroff. I move that we approve May's minutes. Thank you. We have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Bridget, I'm on second. Thank you, Bridget. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same side. Motion carries. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, we will just move right on forward to our county council district updates. I know that there's been some decisions made and we have our boundary maps. So, Rebecca. Yeah, so um, I went to through all of the addresses of our current board members to verify and uh, see what uh, changes may have happened to the board structure and what districts that we may be uh, falling into. We were very lucky that only it only affected two board members. And uh, so Lance Carter is going from a community rep district uh, four to community rep district five. And then uh, Melanie Green was a uh, community that's uh, rep district three and is now community rep district four. So with Lance moving, it don't look like it's not, so it will not affect any of our board members. Um, so we'll move forward with filling uh, open spots once we've uh, updated the bylaws, which is our next item on the agenda. Perfect. Thank you, Rebecca. And I'll ask if folks are on the phone or joining us, if you could please mute yourself so we don't get background noise. I'd appreciate it. I think Jacqueline. Thank you. Okay. Wonderful. 
So we'll go ahead and um, discuss that next item, which is amendments to our bylaws. Um, these amendments are both administrative and also will help us adhere to the new district maps. Rebecca, do you want to give us just an overview of some of the key changes? Yeah, so they're pretty simple changes. Um, I sent out the change document with the meeting reminder um, and noted the changes. So one change is the footer. We'll update that to be, uh, if you adopt the changes today, we'll update the footer to um, reflect that accordingly. Under Article 4, uh, or I'm sorry, Article 5 members, starting on page 3, we are going to change uh, sections 1, 2, and 3 that previously said four members of each um, have category of members. We'll now say five members um, in each of those categories. Um, and that will mean that we have a total of 15 regular board members at plus any at large members. Then the only other change uh, was something that was brought up several months ago with our previous executive board. Um, and they were hoping that we could add a little bit of flexibility in our bylaws regarding um, section four under absences and vacancies number two. Previously, the wording was really pretty strict. If you missed two meetings, then you were removed from the board. The executive team wants to make a little bit of flexibility there. And so what I changed is to say, um, in the event a member is absent for two regular meetings without prior notification to county staff, and then amended to say, the board shall contact the member, I'm sorry, the board chair shall contact the member to discuss participation in the advisory board. If no resolution is made, their position shall be declared. So those are all of the changes that are being proposed for the board to consider. Thank you. Um, board members, I'd like to ask for a motion and then a consideration for a second and then open the floor for discussion. Is there any interest in a motion to this approve is Jamie. these? Hi, Jamie. Hi, I move to approve. Thank you so much for that motion, Jamie. Got a second from second. Bridget. From Amy. Thank you, Amy. Okay, we have a motion to second. Any discussion on the amendments to the bylaws as outlined? Is there any discussion from members of the board? Last call. Any discussion on any of the amendments? Okay, hearing none, because these are our governing documents and bylaws, I will ask for a roll, roll call vote. Rebecca? Bridget McLeeman. Aye. Amy Rourke. Jamie Spinelli. Aye. Karen Camera. Aye. Lance Carter. Lance may be having technical issues. We'll watch the Megan Molsa. Hi. Lance Carter, are you able to, to vote on the bylaw changes? She may still be having technical issues. That is all the board members present. And I also vote aye. Oh, sorry carries. That's okay. Sometimes the chair can choose not to vote in parliamentary procedures. That's perfect. Okay, motion carries. Thank you, everyone. That was very fast business. Um, we'll go ahead and just roll on to our March, or uh, actually July 2021 through March 2022 outcomes report. I apologize. I forgot to pull those up. I will have them ready in just a moment. Uh, this is our outcomes report that we provide four times a year and will be provided at the end of the uh, at the after meeting we follow up there we go all right do this all on one screen now much different than doing it on two screens so 
this is our quarterly report. And just a, a, a update to those on the virtual platform, um, board member Rob Perkins is now uh, in attendance. Hello. I got lots in the parking lot. <laughs> That's easy to do. Okay. So we are um, looking at the quarterly report, our outcomes report. Uh, this is for quarter three, year to date, July 1, 2021 through March 31, 2022. Um, I did update the listed programs um, here. Uh, maybe not here. Um, I did. Sorry, it's a. There we go. Um, and I'll show you where I've updated to include some new contracts that we've um, been working on. Our participant satisfaction, uh, we've now sent out through our providers 3,383 surveys to individuals and households that were served in the time frame um, of the report. We received 857 responses, which is um, a 25.3% response rate. Um, and then of those responses, almost 87% indicated that they had a positive overall experience. Um, a few of the notes that were included from the providers um, indicated that some participants requested more virtual options for attendance to case management or different workshops that they were providing. Some participants expressed appreciation for the staff kindness, hospitality, and patience. And then some participants were dissatisfied that they couldn't get assistance that exceeded what the program offered. <clears throat> um, the community action programs haven't changed, so those are all the same programs that we've been funding since the beginning of this uh, request for applications process. Um, however, we have added a couple of programs under the uh, homeless crisis response system. We received some additional funding from uh, the State Department of Commerce. This is not COVID funding, so we wanted to make sure that we reflected that information in our reports to you. Um, and this includes some funding for Janice Youth and their motel voucher program, um, along with um, additional funds to Council for the Homeless Emergency Motel Vouchers that explain to their same program. And then YWCA also received motel voucher program funding. There were other funds that we received that went into existing rapid rehousing programs or our standalone programs, but are in addition to support the existing stand, um, rapid rehousing programs. So the names are um, not included in this list, but there are additional funds to those programs. When we look at the expenditures, a program should be about 75% spent out in their allocations. Now we're in our third quarter uh, for reporting. When looking at the community action programs, um, the programs are uh, pretty much on track for spending. Um, the college uh, financial wellness program has other pandemic related funds that they're using for their emergency grants. Um, they started coming back to using the grant funds from through our contract with them as they closed out their COVID related funds. So they are starting to catch up on their spending. Um, so that's kind of where that program is. And then as has been reported for a while, the Share Hunger Response Program um, spends these grant funds quickly before they go into the private funding uh, that supports a significant amount of the program. When we go down and look at the spending for the homeless crisis response systems, we see things that are kind of um, a few programs that are, are behind in spending. Um, one of those is Bertha's Place. They also have uh, COVID related funds in their um, grant. And so they are focused on spending those COVID funds before they uh, spend the dollars that we have from the state uh, because of the type of timelines. Um, outreach, those programs um, are fairly new to the program. We did report on them the last quarter. Um, and they're just starting to get up and really functioning. Share um, recently started their outreach program, um, and so and uh, we'll see a, a significant increase in outreach efforts in the next portion of this report. Um, and then we also have um, noted that Janice is the newly funded motel voucher program, um, and so they'll be up and spending uh, fairly quickly. 
um, and then share received other funding to help their support um, support their rapid housing program participants. So the percent of their spending went down because they have other funding that they're uh, including in or were including in the report. When we look at the performance of the community action programs, um, the total people served, um, as we reported in the past, it's really common to see um, under the health and social and behavioral health category, so really high numbers because of the uh, Clark County Do Big program, their Fresh Alliance program, uh, serving significantly higher numbers than they have seen throughout the, uh, the pandemic. Those numbers have been very high. Um, and then under support services, uh, 211 info has received um, a significant increase in calls for uh, resources. And that's why those numbers are really high. Um, and you can see that when you look at the percent of uh, meeting their contract goal. Um, we did not change the, the terms of their contract during the pandemic, um, mainly because we just really don't know <laughs> what's going to happen and when it's going to change. So. Uh, we just decided that we wouldn't uh, worry about modifying the contracts um, and understand the, the reasons for the changes to the, the programs. One other note I will, will make is that um, I had reported previously that PIC was struggling to get people into their program um, because they were you know, scared of um, going into the workforce and, and needing childcare and a lot of different things there. Um, but they have been able to recently engage uh, quite a few more participants in their program and offered several new workshops. So they are doing their program back in the morning. And then when we look at some of the fun information that we collect out of the reports, um, we are now up to seven space shuttles for the amount of food collected by the Fresh Alliance program. That's over 1.1 million pounds of food. <laughs> Um, the Clark County Volunteer Lawyers Program has helped 780 households avoid eviction. That's almost four times the number from all of last year. Um, the Share of Hunger Response Program provided over 67,000 meals at Share House. Um, and if you happen to see the Columbian pad, you'll see that they are now back open um, for in-person meals. Um, and people are, seem to be really excited about that. They're still doing to-go meals um, for weekends and um, I can't remember if it was lunches and dinners or one of them is still a to-go meal uh, during the day also. And then the last one on there um, is the, oh, my screen is being funny, sorry. The Housing Solutions Center assessed almost 10,000 households so far uh this year for housing program placement um and they were able to divert 337 houses from the homeless crisis response system uh which is amazing when we move over and talk about the homeless crisis response system performance measures again we should be seeing things around 75 percent uh for the total people served um, the Housing Solutions Center and the significant increase that they've seen, that's what they, uh, that number is significantly higher um, than what uh, is in their contract. Um, and then if you look down at the other ones, um, so the poor um, outreach is new in this report for this quarter. And the SHARE program uh, was able to make contact and work with um three times as many um people who are houseless than they had originally anticipated this quickly into the the program so we're seeing significant numbers coming out of that program um fairly quick um our targeted prevention is on set on um on regular with meeting their requirements there uh, permanent supportive housing should always be at least 100% uh, because their people are housed permanently, so they uh, see some turnover, which is why it goes to 104%. Rapid rehousing, um, in part because they receive those other support dollars and they can help additional households, but really provide those additional support services to households to help them rapidly rehouse and stabilize to move on and help additional households. And then our transitional housing uh, program has remained steady. They continue to have um, a hard time finding um, households that are interested in uh, being housed in a shared living apartment. 
Then when we look at their maintaining or increasing in um, this information, um, we have um, shelter um, households because we've been able to increase the number of cell vouchers in the system that has um, seen an increase. The outreach program because they're able to engage so many households um, and they're repeatedly reaching out to the same households. They're able to kind of get that maintenance and, and understand if they're maintaining or able to find employment um, that will increase their income. Our targeted prevention uh, programs, um, state, uh, Council for the Homeless, previously with their diversion program, had a harder time you know, checking in with households to verify if they've maintained or increased their income, but they've kind of made some changes to their program and now they're able to get that information and be able to uh, report it more accurately. Um, and so that's why we see a, a significant increase in our targeted prevention numbers than we have in the previous quarters. Um, our permanent support housing households, we hope that they all at least maintain that, um, their income. Um, and the housing programs work with them to maintain that income and find other sources of income to help them remain stable. Uh, rapid housing, the main goals um, are to make sure that our households uh, are stably housed, and a large part of that is increasing their income uh, so that they can exit the program into their own stability. So we see um, a lot of effort through that um, goal of maintaining or increasing their income. Um, and then shelter, uh, we've actually seen quite a few more households um, maintaining and increasing their income than was previously reported. <coughs> And then here's um, some demographics. This is pulled from the um, homeless management information system or HMIS. Uh, this is across all of the programs uh, report into HMIS. Um, and so uh, we can just have uh, some information about the households that are participating uh, in the system. And I'll just slowly go and go through these so you can take a quick look at them. Again, I'll submit, uh, send you the report after the um after the meeting and so that way you can uh, deeper dive into the report itself any question yeah when we you said the housing solution center assessed nine thousand nine hundred eighteen in households and diverted three thirty seven I wonder if we did any research on our the breakdown of that 5,918, how many were eligible or how many were eligible for services? So I, I, we've had that conversation in the past with them, and I don't believe they tracked information. <laughs> they, a, a lot of those households are coming in for the emergency rental assistance program. So if they've already received assistance, they they can't receive additional assistance, so they're denied. Um, at that point, if unless they have other funding available, um, I don't believe they track, and I'm not sure if Kirsten's available. If she has any additional information she can share. Hi, I, uh, Kirsten here, and I can tell you, Dale is actually going to be able to field all questions starting at ten. I think he was planning to join. Um, unfortunately, I can't answer that question. Sorry to put you on the spot, Kirsten. Kirsten oh, is that's okay. Executive Director of Council for the Homeless. Thank you. I'll ask later. Yes, and he will. He'll be here just right after 10. He had a previous engagement until 10. I'm always interested in the unmet demand. Why it is not sort of extreme enough, or is it too extreme, or whether they don't comply with whatever rules, because it measures. I will not need it so. Correct. And I know they keep, they do collect a lot of data. I just don't know exactly what data points they are. And they do provide a lot of different dashboards on their website and then annual reports like the equity report. Um, and they do have a report that they release annually uh, that does talk about need. Um, and it actually breaks it down uh, by race and ethnicity. So I know they're collecting it somehow. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll, Kirsten, I can speak to that in that you're absolutely right. We do have the um, the equity report, which will be coming out. And I also would note that on the 12th, next week, 
we are uh, doing a webinar on the systems number report. Um, so that's something that will be open to the public as well. And all of our reports are posted on our website. Um, all previous reports and current reports, as well as the dashboard. Um, but Dale is your, your data man. So as soon as he gets on the call, he can uh, answer the question even more specifically. However, if you can summarize that any questions that you have in the chat, um, I can also run in appearance and send them off to either Melissa or Sunny for response before Dale gets here. We actually can't use the chat because it's not open to public meetings. So everyone doesn't have access to it and we can't record that data. Um, okay. We will definitely get that put together and um, Bridget can ask Dale later or um, I'll also in the follow-up email um, send information about the, the reports that are available on the website. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So um, I can ask. Uh, talked about the evictions uh, of Bergen, right? Yes. Um, um, the question is, um, we have a real number in this report. Do we know the overall eviction rate to any degree of something? We don't. Um, the, there's, uh, and there's a lot of reasons for that. One, um, I think council or I'm sorry, Park County Volunteer Lawyers Program does have some information because they work closely with district court uh, regarding evictions and trying to make sure that people have uh, the information that they need. But there's a lot of informal evictions that happen. Um, a lot of times landlords, um, not a lot of times, but sometimes landlords will just change the locks without notification. Yeah, about that last night, yeah. yeah, so there's a lot of things that happen, unfortunately, that are considered an informal eviction and a lot of people that just um, don't because of crisis they don't know how to respond to an eviction notice um, and so they just leave and then so that it's not actually reported as an eviction um so i don't think we'll ever get perfect numbers um and so i don't know exactly what's happening what i do know is that we're seeing uh, a significant increase in eviction proceedings because of the end of the uh, uh eviction moratorium um, and there's so many households that are behind on rent that we have definitely seen an uh, increase in the eviction filings. There is a new law in Washington state that requires um, that households be notified of mediation services available if they're going through so the landlord can provide them the mediation services and a new program that provides um, representation, so right to counsel, um, and that is getting established here in Clark County and it's going through the Clark County Volunteer Lawyers Program. Um, on the demographics page, it looks like there's a group, is it? Uh, under race? Is there a Hispanic Latino component to this? So that's ethnicity, and because a lot of people don't quite understand what that question is. I um, decided not to include it in the report here because it tends to not be the, the best actual representation of who's being served. Um, and space limitations <laughs> on the report. But yeah, yeah, that would be reported separately. Right, okay. Bob and Bridget for those questions. Any other questions from members of the board? Okay, hearing no questions. I just have a quick question, Rebecca. So this report goes through March 30 and this is the third quarter for this particular program update with the grants that were just awarded. Does the, do those contracts start on July 1? So will they start as of last week? Yes, yeah, those contracts are being drafted and sent out to the providers. They are all aware that they uh, were affected in July. One, um, and they are starting to work on the project. This fiscal year for the report that you're providing us today ended on June 30. So we'll see a year end recap at our next meeting, correct? Yes. Uh, the next meeting gets September meeting, you'll see the year end report. Um, and then in May, we'll do a, a recap of all the finance uh, information. Um, and then starting next year, you'll um, at the January meeting, you'll get your 
first report for the outcomes uh, for all the new programs. Perfect. It's just I wanted to make sure all the board members were aware we, we have somewhat of a quarter lag in, in data, but yeah, but it looks like a lot of the outcomes are already ahead of what the contract requirements were so that it's really nice to see this report. Thank you. Okay, we have a CSBG program monitoring update and is this the one that Department of Commerce just completed Rebecca? This is so I just wanted to give an update to the board that uh, the Department of Commerce, who is our funder for community service block grant funds, both state and federal funds, uh, did an uh, virtual monitoring of the entire uh, CSBG program. So our finance side and our program side, they uh, had uh, an interview process with a Alicia as the chair, where she answered a bunch of questions uh, regarding the board um, and experiences getting onto the board uh, and things like that. Um, it also included interviews with uh, staff. We went through a uh, overview of all the things that we do through like an RFA process, through uh, invoice review, um, and then uh, we also had brought in Elizabeth Fitzgerald with our County Volunteer Lawyers Program, and they did um, a mini monitoring of that program as one of our uh, CSBG funded programs. So she participated in that. It was an all day monitoring and uh, shaken to uh, a lot of factors, including the org standards that we do every year. Um, and that is that 50 point um, administrative process review uh, that we've been able to maintain 100% um on that uh, monitoring that's done every year uh, we received our uh, monitoring report last week from commerce and they had no findings no concerns um two recommendations which we'd already been working on one is concerning my uh results oriented management and accountability national certification um, it had lapsed because I wasn't able to provide as many trainings as, um, as required in the program due to the pandemic. Uh, but I'm working to get that recertified. Um, and actually, that's in process, and that will happen in September. Um, and then the other was because we are short one elected board member. No, um, so we're out of balance of the one third elected, one third uh, low income rep, and then the remaining balance being community members. They know the reason for that is the waiting on the new district map. Um, and now that we have the bylaws updated, um, I will start working on doing um, the outreach and engagement for all of those uh, open positions, along with positions for board members whose terms are ending. And so we'll get that all taken care of. Um, and so we'll be back into full compliance. But um, because they're aware of the process and that, that we are constantly working to get these uh, things taken care of, there's no real concerns about it, just a recommendation that we continue to work on it. Um, the monitoring report has been sent to Alicia for review, along with um, management in our office, and there's been no feedback regarding that. Thank you, Rebecca. And I'll just share. Um, one sentence from the final summary from Department of Commerce, and I, I thought this spoke well to to your work, Rebecca, and um, the work of the folks in the finance division. It says the agency was well organized and had extremely detailed documentation to show evidence or support of the items requested for the monitoring visit. The agency also prepared the documents well in advance of our virtual monitoring visit. Just so the board knows, all of the recommendations and um, summaries were really very strong and very complementary to the program and to this uh, to the team. And I think we should be really proud of the program here at Clark County. Uh, you can get a copy of this if you'd like, um, as Rebecca mentioned. But I think all of you will be very proud to be on this board. And a uh, very good job, Rebecca. Uh, this is really a compliment to you. Thank you very much. Any questions for Rebecca about the monitoring? This is a new question. CSBG stands for Community Services Block Grant. Question. Okay, yes, sir. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just saying Rob was clarifying what CSBG stands for. Just being here. Yes, 
always good to have that acronyms defined. There's so many of them. <laughs> All right, okay, let's go ahead and um, move on. We've got a report from the city of Vancouver on the affordable housing fund. And also if, if you have time, Jamie, to provide a little homeless services update. Sure. Um, so Sam usually does the affordable housing thing. She couldn't make it today, but she did say that the committee to um, kind of determine if we should recommend a renewal of the affordable housing fund uh, levy to city council has met a few times and which I know Alicia is also a part of um, and that they are planning to have a workshop to present the affordable housing fund re renewal committee's recommendation to council in August. Um, if council approves that the levy can be put back on the ballot for voters to decide if they want to renew. Um, so that's kind of where we're at with the affordable housing fund. Um, and then in regards to just homeless services, um, we, the heart team has hired a new outreach worker, which we were very excited about. He started last week um, and he is someone with uh, lived experience here locally. Um, both of the safe state community sites are still running very, very well, very um, whole lot of success coming out of both of those. It's it's really kind of impressive to see. Well, I don't know if impressive is the right word. But it's amazing to watch how um, just a little bit of stability can help kind of launch somebody um, into moving forward. Um, we're still actively looking for another safe park location, but our current safe parks doing very well. Um, uh, and then we have a couple of options for properties for safe stay three, which um, will likely be somewhere on the west side. We're kind of just waiting for property owners um, to get back to us with contract negotiations and things like that. So I do feel like we'll have a safe stay three opening um, sometime within the next six months. Uh... I feel like those are kind of all the high level updates, but I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody has. Thank you, Jamie. If uh, if you're a member of the board and you have questions, feel free to unmute yourself and and ask. Okay, and, and I will share that the um, affordable housing levy, which Jamie just mentioned, does expire at the end of next year. So that was the full seven years that was approved by voters. And as Jamie mentioned, in order for those funds to continue, there will need to be action by council to allow a ballot measure to go out for consideration. And um, really the committee is just focusing on, should there be a levy renewal? What would the rate be in terms of how much funds would be generated and, um, it's been a it's been a good process so far, so compliments to the city team for um, putting together that work group. I know we're ahead of schedule, which we traditionally are because we are um, very efficient here in our board meeting. So I'm not sure if our guest um, from the council for the homeless has joined us yet. It sounded like Dale maybe had some time constraints and he couldn't be here till ten. I don't see that he's attended. Okay, maybe what we can do is we'll um, move forward in the agenda and we'll round back. Um, we are about 20 minutes ahead of schedule at this time, so we may need to take a short uh, recess if he isn't with us by the time we finish the other business. Um, we do have a CSBG Modernization Act advocacy opportunities. Uh, Rebecca has been forwarding uh, federal legislation opportunities for this board to uh, sign in support um, to letters that go to our state um, representatives in Congress. And I did sign on behalf of the of the cab for a single letter that um, had to do with renewing funding for CSBG. Is there anything else that you want to specifically speak to Rebecca on those opportunities? Um, I can just give, give an overview of the whole process because this board has never had the opportunity to participate in this process before because um, the CSBG reauthorization process um, for many years was under the previous authorization 
um, and they've been strategizing and they meaning the national community action foundation, who is the national lobbyist for all community action agencies and David Bradley is the CEO of that. Um, organization, so uh, what is happening is um, there is a line item in the federal budget for community services block grants uh, funding. And when a fund is not authorized, it can be removed from the budget completely, uh, which would mean that community action agencies across the country would lose the primary funding for their organizations. If it is reauthorized, um, it is reauthorized for a specific amount of time. In this instance, they're requesting 10 years. Um, and so then it would be set at a specific amount of funding for the next 10 years during the authorization period for the grant, which means that it sets the low bar of the minimum amount of funding that the program can receive uh, moving forward during that 10 year period. It can receive additional funding if Congress has to provide that additional funding, but they cannot go lower than what has been authorized in the Reauthorization Act. The uh, process has been going for a few years now, um, but this is the farthest we've been able to get the process going through Congress. Um, it was recently passed by the House with bipartisan support um, and now is moving on to the Senate. Uh, the Senate, they're anticipating uh, more pushback on the program. Um, and so they're really leading as much um, advocacy effort on behalf on the part of the community action agencies across the nation to help our senators understand the importance and the impact of community action programs and the community services block grant. So um, as I get notifications about the process and uh, requests for advocacy, I will make sure that I forward those on to the board so that you can uh, participate as you see fit um, and hope that we can get the uh, Senate to approve the reauthorization. Uh, the fear at this time is if we don't get it uh, brought to the Senate Health Committee, uh, then and, and approved out of committee, then it will not be brought to the full Senate um, and uh, it will take us uh, into the next congressional session where we have to start all over again with getting it approved uh, through the House. And there's definite concerns about what the next Congress is going to look like. Uh, so any advocacy efforts that we can make um, uh, and during this session um, is greatly appreciated to really move forward and get the CSBG program reauthorized and a set amount of funds. The other big change that is being lobbied for with this reauthorization is a change to 200% of the federal poverty level. When we received the COVID funding, um, they gave a time limited increase for serving people up to 200% federal poverty level. Historically, CSBG funds have only been able to serve people up to 125% of the federal poverty level. Um, the reauthorization would hopefully, if approved as is, uh, increase it to 200% uh, federal poverty level where we could expand who is getting assisted through the programs that we're funding. So those are the kind of the big updates on reauthorization and uh, why you're seeing more emails uh, from the National Community Action Foundation specifically for um, advocacy efforts to pass the bill. Thank you, Rebecca. And we do have, um, this board does have a legislative advocacy committee. We focused this last year primarily on uh, legislation at the state level, and we didn't do much work at the federal level, but this was an opportunity for us to, to start taking action as a community action board. But we do have some work to do as a committee to kind of put together our framework and um, making decisions on when the chair, myself, should take action independently on behalf of the board versus when we will have discussion and um, find consensus on the opportunities that we uh, decide to take and, and sign in support of or in opposition of 
potential legislation. Because this is so tied and grounded to our work and to our funding sources, um, I went ahead and signed on. And um, I know I sent an email out to Karen and Rob and Amy and David to let them know that I took that action who are members of that committee. Are there any questions about legislation, either locally, state, or federally? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Was oh, that uh, Rob? So thank you for signing and sending the notification. And uh, yeah, it, it matches our sense of things. So, so. Working with the Office of Equity and the Attorney's General on the uh, Senate Bill 5793 with compensation low income with the experience. <laughs> Yeah. Go ahead, Karen. Sorry, it's hard to hear um, people in the conference room for those of us online. Um, so I was, I did, I wasn't able to hear everything. But um, just really briefly, uh, I did want to say um, that I was in support of that. Um, I think I just was really short on time the last couple of weeks to even. Um, Reply, so I apologize for that, but I did get a chance to to go over the the stuff that was sent out by uh, Rebecca. So I really appreciate you moving forward and signing off on on that letter. Um, I think that going forward, I do have some concerns about that um, reauthorization for ten years seems like a really long period of time for a specific amount if i'm understanding that correctly um it just seems or it doesn't seem i think it's pretty real that um the cost of housing uh across the nation right now is just skyrocketing so i know it's not just here in clark county and as much as i appreciate also having funding to assist people with housing um when we're continually seeing um, the purchase, large purchases of uh, homes and turning into rentals that are not, there's no slowing down on the cost of rentals at this point. And it doesn't seem like there's any movement for anything like rent um, control or anything like that in the state. Um, it just seems like we're going to continue to see um, higher numbers of people being unhoused with the cost of housing continuing to rise uh, disproportionately to income um, earning and also the increase with like property taxes and even people that are on the margins of being able to pay mortgages, I think is just going to get continually um, challenging. So I, although I support this, I'm also wondering at what point can we also address some type of support to slow down the the continued rise in um, the cost of rentals if that's something that's possible and i don't know how that's related to this specific um reauthorization but um i just kind of wanted to bring that up so thank you and those are all really valid points in terms of our housing market and the stress that the cost of housing places on uh, households. Um, I do know that there was legislation that the Washington Low Income Housing Alliance uh, was focusing on that would have added some form of a cap on increases in rent. So I, I would assume that there will be additional efforts um, in the future at the state level to try to find some solution and relief. And uh, I'm not sure at the federal level what what has been occurring. Uh, Rebecca, do you know with this reauthorization bill and the funding that is being proposed, do they have an inflation um, indicator where we get additional funding per year based on inflation or is it a set amount? Because I didn't get that deep into the actual budget side. Yeah, so no, there's no set aside for inflation, um, but to do keep in mind that it sets the minimum amount that they have to fund, which is 
uh, the proposed amount, and I apologize, I don't remember exactly what the level is. Uh, at, I think it was one billion dollars where we've been getting eight hundred and sixty thousand or eight hundred sixty million nationwide uh, previously. So it is a significant increase that they're requesting, but it sets the minimum amount. So Congress can then increase the amounts from there. I don't know of any funds that uh, through HUD or through the Health and Human Services Office that have a stipulation for an increase based on um, inflation. The other thing I will say is that when looking at the budget for programs that are not authorized, those are the first to see the uh, reductions uh, when uh, Congress wants to limit the size of the budget or they want to uh, put more funding into uh, the defense fund. So, you know, the, there's the whole budget and half or more goes to defense and the other half goes to non-discretionary programs, which is what all other human service funds, uh, services and everything else kind of fall into. Um, and so we see uh, oftentimes a uh, shrinking of the R funds that are not authorized uh, to balance that budget. So with the authorization, it will set a minimum balance for the next 10 years that they cannot A, eliminate the program altogether or B, uh, reduce the amount of funding that is received. It does not stop Congress from increasing the amount of funding as they see fit uh, regarding, you know, situations around that housing and, and other uh, issues that are going on nationwide. Um, in fact, yeah, my sense has been since the Clinton administration, Congress does this every 10 years. And then Justice Lee says they do it. Right. So this is just set a 10 year plan is pretty normal. I, my understanding also is with other programs that have been authorized, it's typically a 10 year cycle that is requested. Congress can actually play advice and rebuild things or reenact things in time to That's the 10 years is not. And CSVG has been um, zeroed out in many budgets across the history of CSVG um, and then uh, saved by Congress uh, at some point. Uh, but we have seen reductions, we have not seen increases. Uh, for services until really COVID came along where we received additional funding there and then with the reauthorization asking for a, a higher amount. So with with that, I'll ensure that we stay on top of advocacy opportunities and take action on behalf of this board and we'll continue to work out our process as a legislative committee. Um, do we have Dale with us yet? I don't see uh, Dale is with us. Um, Amy was mentioning that she is participating in a uh, group that is looking at. Um, it's, the, um, it's the Office of Equity and the Attorney General's Office on Senate Bill 5793, compensating experience, low income experience. So Senate Bill 5793 was passed, and uh, we've also been watching that uh, in our office because essentially it's saying that if it's requiring that more people with lived experience uh, be uh, included in advisory boards and governing boards uh, that oversee funding uh, specific to services that would serve uh, the um the communities that they have lived experience in, but not only does it require that they have more participation in the board, it also requires that they be compensated for their participation. Um, as we know, sitting on advisory boards for some of our board members um, takes away from opportunities of employment um, and things like that. Um, and so they want to have, make sure that all, uh, people with lived experience sitting on advisory and governing boards be compensated. So they're working on what that looks like. And we've been paying close attention to it because um, as we have low income representatives uh, on our board, um, we want to make sure that we're following those requirements also. Um, and so we'll be keeping a close eye and appreciate that Amy is participating in that board uh, to help us stay on top of uh, the different things that are happening. 
Thank you, Amy. I think what we'll do, Rebecca, because I want to make sure we we stick to our agenda is just take a quick 5 minute recess. People can uh, get a cup of coffee. Um, make sure you keep your your account logged in because we will reconvene um, exactly at 1002 and hopefully Dell will join us at that time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and call for a 5 minute recess and reconvene the meeting at 1002. And that way it gives people just a quick opportunity to take a break. Call our meeting back to order. All right, this meeting is being recorded and we're back. It is 1002. We're welcoming our guest from the Council for the Homeless, Dale Whitley. Did I pronounce that correctly, Dale? That's correct. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead and turn the floor over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Dale Whitley and I am the the homeless management information system administrator with the council for the homeless and i also coordinate our annual point in time homeless count um, so i'm going to start a presentation and uh, we'll go over some of the results of our 2022 um, point in time count So first we'll give it a little overview of what the point in time count is and what it isn't. Um, so the point in time count is a, is a, is a, a one day uh, single night snapshot um, of where we're, we're tasked with collecting, trying to collect um, information for everyone who's experiencing homelessness on that one day. Um, normally it takes place uh, the last Thursday in January. That's a HUD requirement, um, but it has to take place within the last Two weeks of January, normally, and then uh, it's a uh, HUD. HUD actually only requires a, a count every two years, but the Washington State Department of Commerce um, has an additional requirement that we actually perform a count every year. Um, so it's useful in identifying uh, trends um, to see, you know, what populations are, are increasing or decreasing, and. Uh, you know, it's kind of like a, I, I think of it kind of sometimes like a high water mark in a river, you know, where you see what, whether it's going up or down. Um, and every year we try to increase uh, the tools that we use and, uh, and whatever else we can uh, develop to, to make it a more effective count um, every year. We've always done that. We uh, look for new ways to, to, to just produce a better point in time. And it helps to, uh, you know, and it help us, helps us to develop our planning for the years and, uh, and funding determinations. Um, look, like I said, looking at those different populations to see if there's a, a, a new needs that are being expressed in our community that need to be addressed. And it's important to bear in mind that um, with every point in time count, uh, since it's just a one day snapshot and, you know, it's just a, a we, we make our best effort, but we know that, um, that that not everybody, you know, is probably able to be counted. Um, so, but it's the best available data that we have um, for this day. So to collect this information, um, there, the, the point in time count results are kind of split up into two sections. There's the sheltered count and there's the unsheltered count. So for the sheltered side, uh, we collect information from our HMIS system. So in Clark County, um, we have the benefit that almost all of our shelters and transitional housing are in our HMIS system. So it makes it easy just to be able to pull the reports um, for that day. We verify with the agencies that their, their, their numbers look correct. Um, and then that's how we're able to easily pull that, that side of the data. Um, and then there are some shelters uh, that aren't able to um, contribute uh, HMIS data, you know, identified data, like such as our DV shelters. And so for them, we work with them to get that information in other ways. Um, for the unsheltered count, so uh, we this is where we spend a lot of the, because HM, HMIS is so easy with the sheltered side, um, a lot of our planning efforts go into to collecting that unsheltered count. Um, so for one of, one of the, 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 the methods that we use for that is uh, service locations that aren't included in HMIS. Some service locations are, but those who aren't like food pantries, um, libraries, um, things like that. Uh, we, we have people uh, collecting surveys 
from people who may visit those locations on that day. And we also uh, collect information from the safe parking programs that we have. We're able to get the information on those uh, uh, people who are, who are residing there on that night. We also get information from our local school district homeless liaisons about the students and families that they're working with. And then, uh, of course, a lot of the, the effort that goes on in the day of the point in time count is a street count where we send out teams all over the county to pre-identified areas um, to collect surveys from people that are that are out there on the streets. Um, so for that piece, we use utilize um, our outreach workers, our, our year-round um, amazing outreach workers who already know the area, already know the people, have those connections, and uh, and and so yeah, that, that um, that's a huge benefit um, being able to to utilize those outreach teams to, to produce that count. And then uh, one of the big pieces of where we collect data is our Project Homeless Connect event. So this is a big one day service fair that we hold on the same day as the point in time count. Um, I call it kind of like a magnet event. Um, so we promote it and, uh, and, and, and people experiencing homelessness are able to go to this event. Normally it's held at uh, St. Joseph's Church typically and they can get haircuts and a hot meal and clothes, and dental care, and vision, eyeglasses, all kinds of amazing things at that um, event. But we also um, collect their survey so that they could be included in the point in time count as well. So, yeah, in 2021 and 2022, we've had to deal with some complications related to the COVID pandemic. And that has affected um, our, our couple, last couple of years counts in, in different ways. So, for instance, in uh, 2021, uh, we were not able to hold a Project Homeless Connect event or um, conduct the unsheltered count. HUD um, gave our county and almost every county in Washington state a waiver for that year. Um, I would say if we look back about a year and a half to January of uh, 2021, um, that was right. So right about vaccines were just coming out to, to health care providers and first responders and it was not very common for people to have be vaccinated. And, uh, you know, many of the volunteers that, that help put on the Project Homeless Connect event or in the more vulnerable populations just for, for multiple reasons. Um, and because, you know, HUD was allowing the waiver um, for safety to say we decided to not do uh, an unsheltered count in 2021. In 2022, uh, our count was originally scheduled to occur during the peak of the Omicron surge in January. If you if you look at the Clark County Public Health numbers of uh, COVID rates, it's it's pretty crazy how if we had held it as originally scheduled um, in the last Thursday of January, it would have been right at the very peak. You know, it kind of went along and went along, and there was a huge spike with Omicron. It would have been right there. HUD um, allowed our county and many other counties um, to receive a one month uh, delay waiver. So for the first time, we didn't hold the point in time count in January, we held it at the end of February. And again, if you look at those Clark County Public Health numbers, end of February, those numbers were back down again. So uh, that I think uh, worked out to, to hold us safer. So yeah. Um, the point, you know, one the point I want to make is that this was the first year that uh, the point in time count was held in February. So February twenty fourth is the day. So some highlights from this most recent uh, count: uh, we we had expanded uh, our professional outreach team participation. So we've benefited recently with having a, a expansion in our number of outreach teams that do year round um, um, outreach in our community. And so, uh, like I mentioned before, this is just a huge uh, win to have all these people who already have connections. It's part of the challenge of doing a point in time count, going around and trying to survey people that don't trust you, um, is to have these people that already have a connection. They've, they've already known them, they know where they are, they, they're easier to find and easier to collect a survey from. Um, 
And so, yeah, I just can't say enough good things about all the people that are doing that work in our community. Um, so, yeah, again, this was the first year the count occurred in February instead of January. Uh, and this was the first year that the count occurred during a severe weather day. Um, so these severe weather days get called when it's going to be freezing weather um, and additional shelter beds, overflow beds are opened up um, for people on those nights. And it's just so happened that in every previous point in time count that I've been involved in over the last decade, um, that it's never been a severe weather night on the night of the point in time count, but on February 24th it was. And again, we've uh, we used uh, a mobile app to collect the surveys, which has really benefited. Um, everybody who uses the app has, has talked about how much better it is than going out with paper clipboards as we used to do and filling those out in wet weather and um, yeah, having to rely on people's uh, handwriting and and, uh, and soggy forms. So uh, yeah, and then another thing, yeah, I just wanted to, to mention was that we. Uh, we're able to this year safely hold um, the Project Homeless Connect event. Um, we did, you know, try to make it as safe as we could with social distancing restrictions and face masks required and all of that. Um, but uh, for everybody that's been involved in that, it was it was a big relief to be able to hold that event again. So here are some um, high level results of the point in time count and with some comparisons to the last year that we were able to do the full unsheltered count uh, 2020. So you can see the total number of people that were counted this year was 1,197. And uh, that does represent a 31% increase from two years ago, the end of January, 2020. And the number of unsheltered counted were 625 people. That was a 21% increase. And the number of people that were counted in an emergency shelter was 389. That was a 45% increase. And then the number of people in transitional housing was 183. That was a 39% increase. Um, over here, we have some, uh, some demographic information about those people. 42% were women, 57% were men. I self-identified that one. Um, 223 were chronically homeless, and that was up 13% from 2020. 51 identified as survivors of domestic violence, that was down 20% from 2020. And then 27% of, of the people surveyed um, identified as people of color. And then you can see down below, um, we mentioned that 14% of the Card County population um, are recorded as people of color. So you can see that um, homelessness more adversely affects um, people of color or at a higher rate. Is this including children or just adults? Uh, this, is, this includes children and adults. Just saying that Kenny bent up down by January for that. For yeah. school districts, is that like just for students? That's what I was going to say was because on the school, I took the school report cards and I looked at those. I went through a super long time counting all the homeless that it had in all the schools in Clark County, and there was that many. Yeah, or that maybe they just they just served it, but they do. Um, I don't think you include like couch crashing situations. Uh, no, this is this is these are people that meet HUD's definition of literally homeless. Yeah, yeah. so. I just wish there was a way to correlate the two. I know because that's and it's crazy because there's so many kids on that. That doesn't have some right. Don't have it steady. So let's remember this uh, this twenty percent twenty one percent increase on the number of unsheltered because we'll we'll um, refer back to that. Well, of course, the like what six thousand? I think. I mean, there's one with like four or something. Let's go ahead and hold our questions till the end of the presentation. And, and just in case uh, he's going to touch on some of our questions throughout the presentation. Is that okay with everyone? Yes. Okay. Thank you. And, and, uh, and it's important to bear in mind um, that with the point in time count that we're looking at 1 specific day. So it's easy to sometimes when you're referring back to other numbers that you've heard. 
um, you know, to possibly conflate them with ones that we're looking at annual numbers. Or something like that. So just want yes. to mention that as well. So uh, there was an increase in people within the sheltered count. Um, 389 people were counted in emergency shelter and 213 in 2021. Uh, so uh, the 45% increase is largely due to an increase in the number of year-round emergency shelter beds. So we had a, a large increase in our bed emergency shelter bed capacity um, within the last year. Uh, with the addition of Bertha's Place and Bertha's Two and the Safe Living Outpost uh, community, there's just a lot more emergency shelter beds for people to, to fill. And also the family shelters uh, were, were finally able to, to fully reopen. So in, uh, during the, the COVID pandemic with our social distancing restrictions and, uh, uh, and some families were just hesitant to go into a congregate living situation, uh, we were able to this year see uh, the, the, you know, um, more people in the shelter beds. And also, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this was the first night that uh, was a severe weather night. So those additional overflows or overflow beds were available for people to fill as well. And then there was a, there was 39% more people um, in transitional housing. So we had more people, more family shelter beds. And then on the unsheltered side of the count, um, there were less unsheltered family members. So even though there was a 21% increase in the number of unsheltered people, there were certain sections where there was a decrease, certain de different demographic groups. And one of those were, were family members. So in comparison to the 2020 count, uh, there were 42 more people staying in family emergency shelters in 2022. And there were 49 less people in families with children that were experiencing unsheltered homelessness in 2022. So um, I don't want to draw a straight line between those two uh, because there could be, you know, other factors in play. But it, you know, we we did see a decrease in the, on the unsheltered side when there was an increase on the sheltered side. Um, another group uh, that had some progress uh, were uh, seniors. So every year since 2017, we've been continuing to see a consistent annual growth in the number of unsheltered seniors, 62 and over, that were experiencing homelessness. That's out homeless, unsheltered homelessness. So there were only three counted back in 2017, and that's gradually increased. Uh, it got up to 37 uh, by 2020. So the, the last year that we had that unsheltered count. Um, so early in 2022, Bertha's Place was open, and they actually opened in um, late December, but it took a while to get the, the rooms filled, get a little bit ready in there. Um, but by the time of the point in time count, um, they were open, and the uh, one of the populations prioritized for that location are seniors age 55 and up. So for this year in 2022, um, this was the first year that we didn't see any growth um, in that unsheltered population. The seniors age 62 plus um, remained at 37, the same as two years ago. So there was a unsheltered increase in singles. So, so where did that, you know, that 21% increase in the, uh, the unsheltered population come from? And um, the answer to that is in singles or couples without children. And um, also to a lesser extent, the unaccompanied youth population. Um, so, so that 21% increase that we saw in that overall unsheltered uh, population was largely due to uh, the increased number of singles or couples without children. That was a 45% a increase from 2020. And then unaccompanied youth um, also increased. In 2020, the number counted were uh, two. And in uh, 20, 
2022, that number was 18. So that was another population group that did increase. So uh, nearly two out of three people experiencing homelessness do not sleep outside. Um, from the, the all those the surveys collected and all the different sources, we saw that 36% uh, of people indicated that they, they do sleep outside. 33% um, were from emergency shelters, 15% in transitional housing, and 16% of people uh, surveyed were sleeping in their vehicles. So we have about three minutes remaining just as a time check. Okay, then real quick, um, I'll, I'll just mention that, uh, you know, as we know, we have an affordable housing crisis in Clark County, which could contribute to some of these things. Um, so the spring 2022 apartment market report shows a 2.7% vacancy rate for one bedroom apartments and 29 for two bedroom. And the, uh, the current uh, housing wage needed to afford the average one bedroom apartment in Clark County is $25.6 an hour. Um, I referenced some couple reports here where you can find that information. Um, they're they're pretty cool. Uh, the National Low Income Housing Coalition. You can actually see you can choose different counties. So you could choose Clark County compared to Spokane County, which we often get compared to size wise. Um, and you can see that uh, that like in Spokane County, that average wage to to get a, a one bedroom apartment is um, like fifteen dollars an hour. The big difference. Especially when you look at what the minimum wage is, um, counties much closer in Spokane. So um, I can provide links to those, Rebecca, if you wanted to send those out too afterwards. So we don't have time to look at them. Um, any questions? One bedroom is twenty five sixty an hour, single forty hour work week. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and the report actually shows um, how many hours you would need to work to be able to afford um, the apartments in, in Clark County as well. Important uh, to note that those are 2021 figures as well, so they don't, they're not in the current 2022 market. Yes. Any questions for Dale? I wanted to clarify. So I think this is the third time I've heard this report, so I'm getting better at this. Uh, the age group for the term unaccompanied youth is that um, minor children, or is it moved up to twenty six years old? Or, or um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's it's uh, less than um, eighteen, I believe, and and there's no adults in the household, right? They're they're by themselves, like the youth themselves. So. Uh, we get those, we get mostly get those numbers from the school districts. Okay. The report card says different. Well, the report card that you're seeing also includes those who are doubled right. up in CAP survey. So that, and it's an annual report, not just the day. Like the company okay. on, on there. So how many though? The, this was showing 18 unaccompanied, unsheltered, unaccompanied you. And that's in the point of time count. On the one day. One day. Yeah. That's the point in time counts 18 out of the 1100. So, number, right, Dale? Well, they're unsheltered. So, you can't, you can't compare the numbers because they're, you're just comparing apples to pomegranates. So if you've got two very completely different things going on, you could dissect the report that you're thinking of for the schools to get more information out of it, but you cannot correlate them between the point in time count. Right. That's very important. Thank you for that clarification, Rebecca. Yeah. Um, any specific questions for Dale on his presentation? Uh, speaking about the school liaisons, how detailed, what, what kind of information comes from them? Uh, is it the... And, that's related to the point in time. Yeah, so we get we get the number of households, the number of people in the households, the gender of the people in the households. Um, yeah. That'd be the data from uh, the school. 
school districts. Okay. So I'm interested in the system's capacity. We want to increase our ability to provide long term goals, capacity. But we're still seeing numbers going up. And it looks like the chronically homeless number has not gone down anyway. And I'm, I'm wondering if we do any research on the amount of unmet need that there currently is in the system. So, unmet need, I mean, that's that's one of the, the, the um, part of the, so the unsheltered count of the point in time count is one place where we're able to see some of that information because um, these are people that aren't in shelters. Um, they, they may be, you know, working with outreach workers, um, but they're, they're still currently experiencing homelessness. Um, so that normally, th those kind of numbers would be considered partial unmet need. They're not in a program. They're not, um, you know, they may, maybe they've been assessed. Um, maybe they're on a wait list. To eventually get some housing assistance, um, but anyone in that unsheltered column is uh, would be part of that, that current unmet need. Wait. Okay, Dale, thank you so much, and I know um, you'll be sending around some resources and links for us so we can dive a little deeper into the data. Um, but would you also be willing to share your contact information in case there are additional follow up questions from members of the board? Absolutely. Oops. Great. Right there. <laughs> Take a screenshot of that board if, if you're interested in reaching out to Dale. I know there's a lot of good information on your website as well. Um, with that, I want to thank you so much for joining us this morning and presenting the point in time count. And I also want to uh, let the general public know that this is an opportunity for um, open public comment. We do that every uh, time we meet. So, is there any members of the public who wishes to comment this morning? Are there any members of the general public who wish to comment? You can unmute yourself. Any members of the public here today to comment? Hearing none, we'll go ahead and close the open public comment portion of our agenda. Um, we've already discussed the advocacy opportunities under other business. So there really is nothing left on our agenda today to accomplish and it is 1029. Go ahead and give you back this 20 seconds of your day and go ahead and adjourn. Thank you all for joining us and for those who showed up in person. Um, nice to see you virtually and hopefully next time in September on the 7th when we meet again, I'll be there with you. We'll Meeting see you. Again.